called a kind of mutation and reduction. And uh, since we experienced a little global warming, I did some act of adaptation. I took off my jacket. Please join me. <laughs> Climate change is nowadays almost in everybody's mind and sometimes on your home screen, on your TV. It's the subject of Nobel Prizes and it shouldn't end there. But it's also in the media and often not in a very informative in the media. And I start out with three or four images how the media depict climate change. Just to remind us this is not the kind of public education we need to make progress on that issue. Having said that, what does it look in the media? The day thereafter, well, we will have storms and hurricanes, but this is only how it will look in the rooms. Here the storm surge is rushing to midtown, not far from here. And obviously people are frightened. Climbing up public library. But sometimes what the media depict is actually not that different from what sometimes reality is about. This is reality. <coughs> On the left, it's not climate change. It's the tsunami that hit India in the Indian Ocean countries in 2004. On the right, an image we all have seen too often on TV after Katrina in New Orleans. So, what are now the, the facts? Or what are really the facts about climate change? Because images, either fantasy like before, or those shown here, appeal to the human nature. But we will have to take also a very <coughs> rational approach. If we do not, we will find ourselves in situations like those. And so it behooves me, with a scientific background, to guide you a little bit through what are, what I perceive as the facts that we should take note of. Well, first of all, we make greenhouse gases. If we consider the northeastern states, New England, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, as a nation in the world, then we would rank where we are up there, northeast. What is it? Six or seven on the scale. So what we do here clearly has global consequences, and we are part global pattern. When you look, of course, who is the front rider, and I should point out, if you read the scale on the bottom, it says 2001. There the United States is the leader in the mission of greenhouse gases. But, as of a few days ago, China is now the front runner. In just six years, they overtook the United States as the prime emitter of greenhouse gases. And so what I am talking about here is not so much how we can avoid putting more greenhouse gases into the world. What I'm talking about is not what climate scientists call mitigation, meaning to not produce more global warming through greenhouse gases emissions, or by reducing energy consumption, 
and all sorts of other options that one has. What I'm primarily focusing here on is the consequences of climate change and how we must adapt to it regardless of what we are doing in terms of emissions and energy consumption and all the other aspects of mitigating climate change. So I'm really focusing here on the adaptation side. And it has become now almost fashionable whether it's the plan in New York 2030 or the governor's plan in New York or Schwarzenegger's plan for California, not yet down in Washington, of course, to be green. Still, even in those very green efforts, whether on the local or on the state scenery, has not yet faced up to the adaptation part. And this will put us square in the eye if we are not starting to think about it in a very conservative way. Where will we find ourselves in terms of our climate? Uh, for those two scenarios that are not discussed in detail but should have. On the lower right here, I depict in fact the past history of temperature increase, which has a large portion, not entirely, but a large portion due to greenhouse gas emissions. Now the future, we don't know we are, we are going to behave, whether we really stop driving SUVs and uh, burning unnecessary energy away and produce greenhouse gases, or whether we go ahead with business as usual and then we have this red curve in terms of temperature change. So we have the option by the end of this century to end up with 5 degrees Fahrenheit more or with 10 or 11 degrees Fahrenheit on average. These are average. So, depending on whether we behave, we end up here near Cape Hatteras. If we don't behave, we end up here down on the South Carolina Georgia border in terms of a climate. Uh, even so, we stay here in New York. And what it will be is hot and muggy. But there are other problems. In more detail, what does mean hot and muggy? Well, for New York, climate modeling shows, and there's some uncertainty, no doubt, but these are the average values, that currently we have on the order of some 15 or so uh, days per year in which the average temperature, the average temperature, not the peak temperature, exceeds 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 20, uh, 32 degrees C. Depending again how we behave in terms of emission scenarios, we can either take the yellow route or the red route. By the end of this century, we are up to about 70 days per year with more than 90 degrees Fahrenheit if we go with business as usual. The ratio is even harder <coughs> on this side. This is a ratio of about 15 to 75, so that makes one of your five to uh, one ratio. When you look at this, the number of days beyond 100 degrees <coughs> Fahrenheit, and that's when we get into the heat stroke kind of situation without AC, uh, then the ratio goes even farther. For about two or three events per year, we go to something like 24 events per year. Now, and it gets hot, we switch on the air condition, right? Well, what you see here is two sets of data points. The open data points and the filled circle. There are 365 in each of those data populations. 
The one is for the year 1966, and the other is for the year 1997. Each data point shows the average temperature for a day in the year. So we see, first of all, that the open points use more energy than the filled points, because that's what's plotted here on the left side. So as time progressed, we have higher populations, but we have higher energy demands. We have higher comfort demands. We switch on more air conditioning, maybe even some more heating. And we get a clear pattern. The lowest energy consumption, and this is the peak daily uh, delivered gigawatt hours. Okay? The, this has a minimum when we have about 58 degrees. Why is that so? Simply because we need neither heating nor cooling. There's still some remnant heat in a building. So while we don't lift necessarily 58 <coughs> degrees in any given building, it is nevertheless the temperature where on the outside, when that exists, we use the least energy. In a winter, which is over here and the temperature is low, we have some higher temperature increase, uh, some uh, higher uh, electricity usage. And you should be reminded this is only the electricity use. It doesn't give you the oil. You know, there's not much electricity used for heating. But you still need electricity to run your oil burner and so on. So obviously, the days are longer. We need more electricity to make light and so on. But look on the right side when it gets hot. It goes through the roof. In other words, the peak demand is really dictated by air conditioning on hot days. Now, I just pointed you to 90 degrees and higher, and 100 degrees would be out here, so that point would be somewhere up there. That's why we may have a tendency towards brownouts during hot summer days, because it's the peak demand and the power companies, generation can just not keep up with it. So we see more brownouts in the future unless we allow more power consumption or reduction in the usage of energy or air conditioning. However we achieve it, we will have consequences either from higher emissions during those times, and we get into a vicious circle. We use more energy to cool, we put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we have to have more air conditioning, and so on and so on. So the question is, how do we break this vicious circle? Another parameter is the number of days with rain more than two inches by centimeters. And again, there are two scenarios here for low emission scenarios and for the high emission scenarios. By the end of the century, we will have about 1.8 times as many days as we have right now. And it varies a little bit from region to region, so it's what given as a ratio rather than uh, as an absolute number. Uh, we have about 1.8 times as many days with two inch per day of precipitation. Now, the last day in the city where this happened was on August 8th. Uh, we had a little tornado over in Brooklyn, but the greater effect was that the subway got flooded. It acts actually as a public sewer in New York City. All the water runs in there. That's not being taken up by the DEP uh, sewage capacity. And uh, so it ends up in the subway. And people couldn't get to work, and it costs a couple of million dollars 
just an off screen alone from people not being able to show up to work. So if that number of days increases, the question is, as a world financial center, do we want these kind of interruptions of our business cycle? Now, here in a somewhat schematic way, I show a little bit what some of the sensitivities of various systems are. And I simply concentrate here on two systems, the transportation and the sewer system. But you can extend it to water, energy, you name one. And on the top here, I have four categories of climate change that we can expect. What I showed you before was some increase of mean temperature, but also of extreme temperatures. So the effect on slowly rising mean temperature of a few degrees by the end of the century is actually not that big. Whether it's on transportation, where it may affect somewhat uh, the materials that we would use on the roads and bridges and so on, coefficients of expansion and things that the engineers have to take into account. Uh, for sewers, it's a little bit more uh, serious because they have to look whether they have enough capacity on average to digest all the uh, precipitation comes down. Uh, since we have a combined sewer system in, in New York City. But what really starts to get uh, more uh, prevalent here or more important is uh, the extremes and I pointed out we have to have more extremes to expect in terms of temperature and rainfall. Then comes the next item. When you warm up the atmosphere you eventually with some delay warm <coughs> up the oceans. It takes some time for this heat to be transferred into the ocean. So the oceans lag somewhat. But nevertheless, when they warm up, water does expand when it warms. And so the oceans get bigger, and where do they go? They say hello on our footstep of Manhattan. Sea level rises. That, in the long run, will have very high impact on all sorts of systems. We will have to elevate, relocate, or protect by levees or other systems our transportation infrastructure, our residential areas, of course, I'm talking here only about the infrastructure system. And we may have to totally redesign our sewer system because the sewer is based on the principle, in general at least, <coughs> to flow downhill. And if the oceans get higher and we have the grade of our canal systems such that it can't flow out anymore, we have to start pumping or devise other means to overcome this problem. These will be huge capital expenses that we will face. And I will you know, later you know, come up with some idea of what some of the numbers are in terms of sea level rise but also a little bit about what the losses are that you can expect from this various impact. The worst thing is in the last call. When we have rising sea level, and then we superimpose on this rising sea level the regular storm surges that we have anyhow, whether that's winter storms that have the name of Nor'easter in these latitudes, or whether there are hurricanes that may get away from the uh, Caribbean or uh, that come out of the Bahamas and uh, other tro tropical regions. When you superimpose those storm surges on the raised sea level, then we are really in trouble. And much what I talk about in a few moments uh, will be related to this particular aspect. Here are some pictures that even in the past we already had problems. Those of those pictures are actually 
nor Easter storms. Nor Easter storms hang around typically for a couple of days, unlike hurricanes that may only come through for an hour or two or three. So you have the chance that you hit several high tide cycles during that nor'easter storm. And the combination of high tides and uh, rising sea level has these kinds of effects. Well, that was down the, uh, uh, where the old fish market was, and there was certainly a lot of fresh fish around on that day. Uh, here, that was in LaGuardia, uh, and luggage was floating around on the airport. Uh, they have since uh, built a levee system around uh, uh, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. When you land, you see on the right hand side a sign that says, Welcome, and they can find a little surface with white pebbles on it. Well, that's not to welcome you, that is there to really keep the water out. That's the levee. Uh, but you can't race that out in Benighton because airplanes can't jump hurdles. Uh, in the takeoff. So there's a limit as to uh, how much you can race it. Uh, eventually, the runways will be raised instead of the limit. Again, that's a big capital project. Uh, down here on the left uh, in 1992, during a uh, winter storm uh, that flooded the path tunnel. Uh, it had actually a very positive effect. Uh, you may think, uh, why? Well, first of all, the past tunnel was closed uh, for 10 days, and so people could be, uh, get across the Hudson, and some uh, thrifty boat owners uh, spotted the business and said, come on board, charge you a couple of bucks, get you over to Manhattan. That was the start of waterways. Look what it grew into. So sometimes disasters can have very positive effects. <coughs> These taxes, of course, didn't go too far on the FDR here that day. Uh, I already mentioned the DEP, the Department of Environment and Protection of the City of New York, has a real problem during those days because it rains a lot. We have a combined sewer system. We have to get rid of the runoff from the streets that goes into our processing uh, plants. And when their capacity is exceeded, uh, then two things can happen. This is actually where they couldn't get rid of the water from the processing plant. Again, because the water level outside the plant was higher than the uh, elevation where they normally discharge. They couldn't discharge. The other side of our combined sewer system is this here. Every black spot on that map here is what the map on the upper left says. It's a combined sewer overflow location. That is to say, the water never made it into the pollution processing plant because the capacity for influx into the plant was exceeded. And so we discharge a combination of both the runoff from the streets with the residential and commercial sewage at these peak times. And so we discharge in New York City still occasionally, not as much anymore as before, uh, polluted water, combined sewage and street runoff into our street system. And that's why New York City at times is in violation of its EPA uh, set regulations. And it will cost a lot of money. And this will get only worse in a double bombing. Sea level is rising, more peak rain coming down from the skies. So all this points not to particularly conducive conditions to improve that situation. Now we get to storms. To introduce uh, a little bit uh, the basic <coughs> dynamics of storms. Most of our hurricanes here come from West Africa. That's where they spawn. 
Then they go just north of the equator, which is down here, and heat up, pick up their food. What is the food for a hurricane? It's the warmth, the latent heat that's in the ocean. The warmer the ocean, the stronger the storms. That's why storms, when they eventually get into the northern latitudes, peter out because the water in the northern latitude of the oceans is not warm enough to pick up their food. There is no food. They are starving to death. But as we warm up oceans, there is in the future a chance that they even find food in the northern latitudes. Typically, many of because of correlative forces, they make sort of right turn back. There are other reasons mythologically that I don't get into it. So a storm system, this one is Floyd from 1999, <coughs> rotates counterclockwise as it propagates northerly along this red path here. So when you are on the right hand side of a storm system, then the winds blow from the ocean towards the land, and the eye moves forward. Those two velocities add up on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, the wind go from the land to the oceans, while the eye is moving inland or northwest. So there, the two velocities subtract from each other. Also, the winds blow, as I said, from the land to the ocean. So it drives the water out instead of in, and the waves sort of go out instead of in. Not quite, but you get the gist. So that's the story here. That's how those things rotate. You see the red arrow here, which is the sum of the forward speed and the rotation speed is bigger than the yellow. That's why you never want to be on the right hand side of a storm. You can move. Move your house quickly to the left side. <laughs> <laughs> Given that, what is the worst case track where New York City and the harbor would be caught in the worst possible track of a storm? It would hit somewhere between Sandy Hook and Atlantic City. When it makes landfall there, you better stop climbing hills. Well, not quite. So what are the details? This is the pattern of hurricanes that crossed New York State over the last 100 years. It's not as much as in Miami, or not as much down in the Gulf of Mexico, but it's not something that we can ignore. It's not Hurricane Sapphire Simpson, Simpson category four or five, so far, the highest is three, three and a half. But as the ocean temperature warms up, we may see more and more of the higher categories, probably not five, but we may inch our way into the category four for this area. So, you know, there are about uh, you know, one to two dozen per century. So that makes about one every you know, six to 12 years or something. Now, there are folks that call themselves risk experts. Now, what do they do? You know that on Wall Street, risk is an important thing, and everybody wants to have a few eggs and a couple of baskets rather on one basket. But New York is one basket. We can't have a couple of New York spread out. So we sit where we are. Those risk experts have devised a scheme in which we can quantify the risk from natural hazards. And hurricanes are one of those many natural hazards, others the earthquakes volcanoes here, but yeah. So let's start with those hazards that we do it. So risk is defined, and those who are 
hit it there, mass feature, it's cool, want to bear with me for a moment. Risk is defined as the dollars per any given year, if it's annualized risk, or it's the dollars per a given event for a given hurricane, let's say. And it can be written out as the sum over the whole region, all around New York. So there's Brooklyn, there's Manhattan, and so So they all would add to the sum. But inside that sum, you sum up over local products. And these local products are made out of three factors. Those factors are the hazard, that would be the wind speed of a hurricane, or it would be the flood height of the ocean during a storm surge. The assets, that would be this house, all the houses, all the infrastructure. So on this, we can put a unit that we call probability per unit time. The probability that in any given year, you will reach, let's say, a 10-foot flood on the coast. The assets have the unit of dollars. It's the value of this house, of that infrastructure, whatever. And then the last factor is what we call vulnerability or something called fragility. That has a value between zero and one. And it's the vulnerability of those assets to the various hazard levels, to the five foot flat, to the 10 foot flat, and so on. So you see some buildings collapse under that load and others don't. Or some have more damage than others. So when that value is zero, and I multiply that with the asset value, then nothing apparently about that. If that value of vulnerability is one, and I multiply it with the replacement value of the asset, that means I lost everything. So when you now have a geographical information system on your computer, you get hold of all the hazards, and I showed you a little bit what those hazards are, and I will show more, and you map out where all your assets are, whether they're in a flood zone or at a higher elevation, and what kind of vulnerability each of those assets have. And you have enough computer time and people that can put the data in their system to actually estimate what the risk is even before the storm arrives. And that's exactly what we do, hopefully having impact on people before the real thing happens. So that's what we're now doing. In this, and this we did in cooperation with State Emergency Management Office, uh, we have the area here, which we call Greater New York, and including uh, Long Island. And uh, we use different storm tracks of different <coughs> category Simpson, Sapphire Simpson 1, 2, 3 storm strengths. And you see they have different geometries sometimes. And they also have different forward speeds with which they forward progress. The eye, some linger along and others race along. Well, so that makes a total of 72 scenarios. And now we crunch the computer and ask ourselves, what's going to happen? But I show you first the distribution of the assets. And we use here the population as a proxy for those assets. We use it actually the real <coughs> asset number, but we also want to know where the people live and so on. <coughs> and then we compute the hazard, which was the first factor out of those three. And there are actually two hazards factor <coughs> with the hurricane that we have to consider. In the upper scheme, you see simply the peak gust in miles per hour where the red colors go up to 100, almost 150 miles per hour gusts, and the green ones are as low as in the upper 60s to lower 70s, or mid 70s miles per hour. So for this hurricane here that passes, you know, just past Staten Island, actually, between Manhattan and 
the Staten Island, uh, just past the Zalman Arrows Bridge here, you have, of course, on the right hand side, the higher gusting speed as we discussed before, and then they trail off to the right. Down here, you have the other hazard. Those wind speeds drive the ocean in, and the blue areas are those areas that are inundated by the water by the storm surge. A lot of it uh, out in Suffolk and a uh, little bit in Nassau. Uh, uh, and we have Jamaica Bay, but we will look in more detail what we have here in the city. When we add up all the numbers, that's the distribution of losses we get. This highest number is the worst case track that I just showed you a moment ago. It's 350 billion dollars or 0.35 trillion dollars in one stroke. And please know that is only the building related economic losses. It's not the infrastructure. No subways, no transportation systems, no bridges, no, no, no power plants, no, no infrastructure is calculated. So you may have to put a factor one and a half to two on it in order to probably come up with the real losses. Now, again, this is the worst track stop, a storm. And you see how quickly that amount of loss decreases as the storm goes out into uh, Long Island, where it makes landfall, because then New York starts to be on the left side, and also how it decreases. You see here, you see some different colors. That's the dark red. That's the category three. Those lighter colors are category two and one storms. So, it depends all on where this thing really hits and how strong it is. Similarly, we can do calculation. What is the total debris that those storms produce? And we have all seen those tremendous pictures from New Orleans uh, with that debris that still sits around these days. So, uh, well, the number on the upper left reads 40 one million tons. If you take 20 ton trucks, which are pretty big trucks, that still makes two million of those heavy trucks of debris. We have a problem getting rid of our garbage. What do we do with this? I think we ship it over to New Jersey. I think the city will be able to have to think about it. What do you do with this? Displaced households, 1.8 million homes. What do we do with 1.8 million people? Households, that's not people. 1.8 million households.
in need to be living in the areas where the waters are rising so they can't enter or leave, definitely during the storm, and afterwards they will have to deal with all the flood water damage, and not just with the wind damage, which will be much more widespread. So these are some of the sobering numbers. Now, we had done earlier in the uh, you know, early 2000s and finished in 2003 a probabilistic study that was not like here that I showed you, scenario based, in which we did it probabilistically. And that allows you essentially to come up with an annualized number. So you take the storms that occur rare but have big losses that occur within 100 years, and then you divide by 100 because it's 400 years. And then you take those storms that occur every 10 or 20 years, and you divide their loss numbers by 10 or 20. So you add them all up, those different probabilities that the storms come in in their variety. And what it tells you is that under current climate condition, whether we know it or not, we're spending already essentially 0.5 billion to 500 million per year, every year. Even so, we don't do that really, but that's what we really should set aside every year to uh, you know, cover the losses that in the long run we Occur. With climate change, we then calculated it would be a factor three uh, by the end of the century. Well, the latest numbers show that actually it will be not a factor three, probably it will be a factor ten in current currency measure by the end of the century. So instead of half a billion dollars we spent annually, de facto average of one hundred years of time, but annualized. We spend five billion dollars per year on storm. Even so, we haven't seen one for a couple of years, and then we will have. Eventually, we will have the big one. So, what does it look in terms of storm surge coverage? This is a map of uh, some of the portions of New York City, Staten Island, and portions of. Excluded, but some of them are in. The red colors are the worst track situation for a category one storm. A little bit hard to distinguish in this projection here with the brown uh, that uh, here is red, here is brown, and then yellow and green for category through two, three, four storms. That's what it will look like for the worst case track. You see uh, that, for instance, here the East River and the Hudson River join along, lo and behold, what is it called? Canal Street. Uh, that's exactly what happened in the last century, no, it's not in the last century, it's now two centuries ago, Nine, uh, 18, I forgot the year, 18 something. Uh, where actually the East River and the Hudson River join hands on the Nuts. The area of downtown is flooded. The area of the World Trade Center site is flooded, including what is it called? The bathtub. Okay? It fills up the bathtub. And we're putting right now a lot of infrastructure price of a billion or more into the bathroom. This is the mash <coughs> of grid points that NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, uses for calculating these storm searches. And I give you just two points on that map to tell you what the height is of those storm surges. For category one, 12 <coughs> feet, 18 feet, 24 feet, and for category four, well, lo and behold, 31 feet. It attenuates somewhat as it goes up the Hudson, 
by the way, that storm surge will go all the way to Troy until it comes to the Federal Dam. That's the end of the tidally controlled estuary of the Hudson. But it will somewhat attenuate in magnitude. That reads from top to bottom 7.8 feet, 11 feet, 11.8 feet, 16 feet, and 22 feet, almost 23 feet. So it's still substantial up there at the tip of Manhattan, uh, but it's slightly less in the order of, you know, about two thirds a little bit more than down on the Battery and uh, the entrance to the east. Now, we not only live in New York above ground, we live also below ground, particularly when we use the subway system. And then there are many, many other systems. They are largely below sea level, and some are near sea level, and some are definitely within the elevations that I just mentioned. What does this mean? Well, it means that the tunnels will go up. We just uh, entered into a pilot study uh, uh, up at Columbia with some engineering professors and their students uh, to actually quantify this flooding of the subway system. And it ain't looked very good. I spent today all day over at the MTA headquarters down there on Madison Avenue. And it's simple. Uh, Central Station. This is sort of the first uh, inkling that the students put together. Uh, this is just the area below Canal Street. Um, and uh, you see some of the subways that go over to Brooklyn. And there are two signatures. You have a thick, heavy line, and you have a thin line. And uh, whenever you see a thick line, then it means that portion of the subway line is flooded. So there are a lot of thick lines, there are hardly thin lines over there, which means virtually the entire subway system is flooded. And that's only for category one hurricane, and we call this the mid Level, level subway flooding. Why? Because we have a low level where only the third rail is being covered by the water. The mid level is when it goes up to the uh, uh, the you walk on. Okay, your shoes get wet, but not your nose. And then the high level is when it covers all the trains themselves in the first person going up all the way to the top of the tunnel seat. But high level would be for us in the whole train as well. So uh, we have maps like this for all the different categories, for all the level types of flooding. And uh, the MTA really has to start scratch its head. And more than that, this will be an extraordinarily expensive capital investment in the decades to come if we want to have a continually safely operating subway system by the end of this century. And it will get progressively worse and worse and worse. And we'll discuss some of the details of how it behaves. Here it is. Because what I just showed you is the condition on that map as of today. That's before sea level. Now sea level ice comes along. And here by the end of the century, you have the following scenarios. The red curve is the projection of sea level rise as it occurred between 1960 and the year 2000. 40 years average. If we project that forward in the future, this is what's going to happen. But, as we said before, global warming is in the making. 
the oceans are expanding, so sea level rise will accelerate <coughs> as the oceans warm. So we can expect, essentially, by the end of the century, that's the most likely range between two and three feet by the end of the century. Now you would say, okay, two or three feet, we can live with that. Well, will you? What's happening is this. As you superimpose the storm surges of hurricanes and oyster storms on this ever-rising sea level, that's what happens to the 100-year flood elevation as we know it today. If that is the 100-year recurrence period, then you reach by the year 2020 with a 70-year storm the same elevation. In the mid of the century, you reach it with a 40-year storm, and by the end of the region, you can reach the same elevation now with a 10-year storm. So what is now a 100-year flood zone on the FEMA flood zone map is actually not the 100-year flood zone in the future. It's a 10-year flood zone <coughs> at the end of the century. Yet, we are using FEMA maps to build projects for the next century in this city. And we give permits to projects totally ignoring these issues. So this is the behavior of how the 100-year flood zone elevation can be reached by the end of the century with a 10-year storm. So the probability increases, or conversely, the 100-year stop, 100-year flood elevation will, of course, increase to much higher elevations than it does right now. So climate change and sea level rise become active, or effective, I should say, over decades to centuries. Now, buildings also last at least decades. And cities at least have ambitions, and their infrastructure have ambitions to last centuries. And we have seen our bridges and water supply system just doing that. There are now many of them a little bit over a century old. Some of the subway systems are almost 100 years old. So, that's why we say beware of sea level rise. These are sort of the same time constants. Yet we invest now in our future infrastructure without considering that they have to function in 50 and 100 years to deal with the new climate situation in sea level. Thus, it behooves us to think that it's wise to plan now for the future and plan now for climate change, then capital assets are designed, modified, or sometimes even just preserved. I mean, can we really preserve our subway system? This will be a humongous task. If we don't use this foresight, then the future costs will be not only the costs adapting them later than sooner. But we will have on top all the losses like you see it in New Orleans. But you could have fixed the problem for ten million dollars and now you have a sixty to hundred million dollar situation on <coughs> So how do we go about making policies that are risk aware and how do we go about it in a systematic way? Well, we can go back to our risk equation. Because what we want to do is minimizing this risk. <coughs> how do we minimize it? Well, we have the options to have no assets. <coughs> well, I can't think of a New York without assets. So that's not an option. We can reduce hazards. Well, that's called mitigation. We can reduce emissions, 
slow down the global warming, slow down the sea level rise, but there will be still a regular hazard, as I said. So that's not the only thing we can do. So now let's look at the combination of hazards and assets. What is that called? That's called land use planning and zoning. That's where we put our assets with respect to hazards. Do we put them in the flood zone or outside the flood zone? So the considered placement of new assets or relocation of essential assets or possibly, we will discuss that a little bit more and I have a question mark behind it, we can protect them with landing from them. But if you do that, there's always the issue of equity. Who is inside the levees? Who is outside the levees? Do the people outside the levees in the Dakota and Illinois pay for our waterfront problems? Or do we pay it ourselves? Do all New Yorkers pay, even some only are protected? So we have to think politically and realistically when we make these demands. Who is paying for this protection and who is protected? You are running. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I running? <laughs> we can modify the vulnerability of the assets even so we still expose them to the hazards. That's called good engineering, construction <coughs> quality control, building codes and code enforcement, retrofitting of existing assets, raising them in the terms of flooding, or perhaps, like the LaGuardia Airport, reinforcing levees and strengthening pump stations or the subway system. So these are not land use options. These are engineering options. And a city and each individual project will have to think about which combination of those factors does it use when it wants to minimize the risk. And that's an issue of public policy and dispute and discussion. And it will take a lot of that to implant that in the mind of our decision makers, and it won't be in our decision makers' mind if it's not in your mind. So that's why we all have to work on this. Now, what are some wonderful examples? <coughs> well, unfortunately, we have an opportunity to rebuild the World Trade Center site. That sits in the bathtub. No levy system, to the best of my knowledge, not yet any pumping system planned to the extent that it could deal with the flooding from a hurricane. A multi-billion dollar project without serious consideration of conditions that will be upon us at the end of the century at latest. That is a cross-section, and that's my best estimate of what will happen. All this stuff underground will be certainly having wet feet, if not more. Let's go my, to my own alma mater, Columbia University. And I have had some pretty rough discussions with some of our people internally lately. Uh, there's a wonderful project going on in many respects. And you know many of you have listened to a speaker here in this room or somewhere else in architecture and so piano. <coughs> Interesting designs. They're yeah, community issues. I'm not discussing right now the community issues. I'm strictly discussing risk. 
This is the layout of the ultimate development plan, several blocks from 125th Street to the lower 130s up there. <coughs> Hudson River here, there's currently a nice park project um, coming almost to completion. If you shop, we go sometimes to the area here. That's the current envelope uh, of buildings. That is the plant envelope of the buildings. And that's my color scheme for the hurricane project, <coughs> according to Noah and mapped by Nicino of the New York State Emergency Management Office in the area. But that's in a way deceptive because similar to the World Trade Center site, <coughs> there's a plan to have a singular bathtub which connects all underground structures over several blocks with the exception of an existing building, so called Studio Baker building, which means the entire area will be vulnerable by what is the lowest point of entry of the water. Just like when you fill up your bathtub, the water comes in on one side, but it distributes throughout the bathtub. Nothing different here. Unless they start to compartmentalize and essentially have a basement under each structure, which they could have done in the first place. <coughs> Now, when you look at the female flood zone, they are totally in compliance with the flood zone map. But that's more a problem with female than we have. The blue area is the 100 year flood zone as mapped by FEMA some 30 years ago. On the other hand, it says revised 95207. I wonder what they revised. Certainly, they did not revise for sea level that has already occurred, nor have they revised it for the future that those structures will have to be exposed to flooding. When you look again at what the NOAA projections for individual categories are, it's ranges between 10 and almost 30 feet. When I look at cross sections and do my little trick again, there's a lot of basement here in that bathtub <coughs> that will be underwater. If you go back one or two slides before, you will see it says energy plan. So a lot of the infrastructure that supplies the light lines to all those buildings will be in their basement. <coughs> they are not on the roof line where they would be safe. There are other structures like the swimming pool and so on, well, that can be cleaned. You can move the, car the, the garage, of course, by entering before the storm or drag them out and dump them the cars after the storm, depending on how much you know, warning and precautionary actions being taken. But, you know, for me as a risk assessment person, it's somewhat disheartening if your own institution that should be on the forefront on those matters has a hard time absorbing that kind of information into its planning process. And it just shows how hard it is. I mean, you know, supposedly I can say Columbia has a couple of smart people out there. <laughs> if they can't do it, and if the city can't do it, who should do it? That's not the end. We have more. This is a very nice view. You all may recognize the element part of the uh, Riverside Viaduct. 
you're looking along 12th Avenue to the north. Uh, you know, it certainly looks very good on the uh, uh, conceptual vision of uh, architects. If you think that there's really all this street life going on, uh, but uh, you know, I have to remind you that these are the elevation that we talked about. Not to speak of the underground structures. So the question is, of course, what is the probability of these kinds of events? But they will become more frequent. Well, what other projects are going on in the city? We just had, for the last few years, uh, a lot talk about Greenpoint Williamsburg rezoning and development <coughs> with, I must say, uh, luckily, a nice waterfront park, which could act as a buffer zone during storms. But we, of course, will have a lot of structures sitting on the waterfront and again, they are obviously designed with the current FEMA flood zone map as the baseline. So unless the city uh, doesn't change its building code and uh, gets either together with FEMA, which they are right now talking about, it was called today, to redo the flood mapping for New York City, or will do it on their own if FEMA doesn't move prudently and fast enough, then we will place many of our assets in places where they simply will be at risk, an increasing risk as the decades progress. The flood zone map looks surprisingly <coughs> similar to this. this are uh, the same kind of flood zone heights that I've shown you before for the category 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, so clearly there will be impact, of course, in Utah and River 2, and there's a you know, sewage treatment plant and so on. All the DEP starts to finally take note of those issues. They have started to internalize it. But I think the rest of the city really has to catch up in terms of thinking about its future. The Village Voice, of course, took the attitude that the Village Voice does. Uh, it ridicules many of the actually positive efforts in the city, like the Plan 2030, has a very interesting mitigation component in its plan. I really congratulate the city that it took that on but it hasn't faced up to the adaptations. You're still planning a sea level will stick down there where it was. You still plan our the capacity of our sewers and water treatment plants as if there wouldn't be more rain coming down several days a year. The subway system is not in its pumping capacity capable to even get rid of the rain. On this, we change a lot of things. And it's certainly an open system that your hurricanes can flood, and it will take some fantastic amounts of money to deal with that issue as we approach the end of the century. And it's not in any capital plan. You know, it's just sitting in today at an internal session with the MPA. It's not in the capital plan yet. Now, as I said, we have a green plan, but greening is only one foot to walk on. That's the mitigation foot. We have to walk on the adaptation foot as well. We can't hop along on one foot into this century. Now, other people are subject to a lot of ridicule. That's the Dutch system. They have learned how to live the little sea level. But they start to get really scared looking at the global warming issues and what it means for their countries. <coughs> because there, it's the entire country. Virgin, almost, not quite. 
but they are doing in a national, conscientious, clearly planned way where there is a consensus across the entire nation. In the United States, we act, of course, more often as this United States, where the center of the country and states couldn't care less what's happening on the coastal front. In the East Coast, cares a little about the Californians and their earthquakes. And the Californians care a little about Floridians and New Yorkers about hurricanes and oysters. We are just too big to be truly United States. And therefore, if you want to rebuild, for instance, New Orleans, like the Dutch would have a recipe for, that needs a national consensus. Because if you do it for New Orleans, you have to do it for Houston, for Sacramento, for Miami, for Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. And soon it will get very expensive to do this. Right now, New Orleans is sort of the tip of the iceberg because they are already below sea level for these large portions. But we have in New York areas below sea level. We call them subways. Who will bail us out? Who will pump us out? When you have a united nation behind a threat, then you can act. And that's what the Dutch do. They have humongous investments, very ingenious. But despite of that, just to give you actually a sort of a comparison, they built for the 10,000 year store. We were told New Orleans was built for the 100 year store. Turns out the 50 year store must have made it easily across the living system. That's the kind of difference we're talking about. Orders of things. So, two orders. It's not a thousand years ago, it's a ten thousand years ago. We didn't even make a hundred years ago. So, will that happen? Well, some people have thought, well, oh, let's not fix the subway system. Let's just put some storm barriers in a couple of places. And this is uh, from our Sunni Stony book. Project where they make a feasibility study, which is done with the hydrology part of it, not the engineering part, where they propose that there will be one between Staten Island and New Jersey, the other kill and other kills out there. One would be near the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, and one will be either near the Fox Neck or Whitestone Bridge. <coughs> That still leaves large portions of Brooklyn and Queens exposed in Jamaica Bay, so you can think of possibly putting another one there. The problem is that you have to put pretty high levees along the barrier islands here to keep the water out, because that's not enough, because that's too low an elevation. So you still have the problem that even if you do all this, there are people here that are left out, there are people here that are left out, Still out there. Now, even if we <coughs> come to a consensus to do that, and I'm sure that for instance, New York City Transit will love this piece because they don't have to pay for those levies, and so they don't have to fix their service system. So there will be a lot of political pressure to build those barriers. But what's the problem with those? Well, we have seen it already a little bit in New Orleans. But the problem is really up here, not at home. It's up in Greenland. The latest 
scientific studies that came out over the last two and a half years, since essentially the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, made its last release, in which they stated certain elevations of sea level, but said, plus some more, but we don't know exactly what it is because we don't know how to deal with Greenland and Antarctica. Well, here is some projection what could happen or multiple scenarios what could happen. These are decades, 200, 400, 600, 800, 1,000 years into the future. And there are some parameters here. What if the global warming can be stopped at three degrees higher than now, five and a half degrees higher, or with business as usual, eight and eight degrees. That's how sea level, just from Greenland contributions alone, will rise. Three feet, six feet, nine feet, twelve feet, fifteen feet. That's before these storm surges. So can we build not just in New York, but in New Orleans, in Sacramento, the entire valley where we get all our produce from, all those oranges and all that lettuce and everything you eat at home, comes from a valley that's hardly below sea level. It's held, the ocean is held out in the Bay Area by levees that are subject to earthquake and are subject not to hurricanes like we but to storms. If a, during a storm an earthquake would occur, for instance, and it would flood the Central Valley, not only would salinity wipe out the fertility of one of the largest producer areas in the United States, it would also affect Los Angeles because they get part of their water out of the Central Valley. This will be, yeah, that's another one of those disasters where you interact. So, the question is can we really build levy systems around the nation, including in New York City, to keep those ever rising sea levels really up? Because you see, for every foot height that you have to add to the height of a levy, you have to make it three times wider because there's an angle of repose roughly 30 degrees, give and take. So you start to build humongous structures. And that's why the Orleans couldn't get its act together. Because in order to raise the levees in the Orleans, you would have to tear down the most expensive housing right on the Mississippi River waterfront that were able to look over those levees and in order to make those levees higher, you would have to raise the uh, widen the base, and you would have to tear down the front row. There was objections you can make. Well, that's the result. If the community can't get its act together, regardless of all the things that happen with FEMA, you're in trouble. So we better get our act together here in this city. This is only the contribution, contribution in the next 100 or 200 years from Greenland alone, which is minimal. But if it starts to take off, and this uh, paper was published three years ago, it's now outdated. We're already here somewhere. Contributions from Greenland alone. So this is outdated already. I think the rise will occur faster. It will end up roughly eventually here, but it will be more shaped like this. Climate scientists will continually update these kind of curves. But that doesn't mean we can sit there and wait until they come up with the next forecast. I think we better get our act together soon. Here is an elevation map of the New York City crater. The city area, including Long Island. So, all that stuff that's slight green is uh, between zero and five meters. That will be gone eventually. The question is when. And here's a blow up of New York 
city called Parsonsville. So we better think how we leave this to the real estate, where we have what, how we secure our infrastructure, and all the rest. So here I come to my conclusion. There will be six or seven of those slides up for you. Yeah, it's clearly a fact that there will be more greenhouse gases. The question is only how do we behave, not just in this city, but globally, and the Chinese, and the Indians, and everybody else, and the United States. How much will come still now? Depending on that, you know, I have either more or less global warming, you know, I have more or less sea level rise, but we definitely can expect also some more extreme events. So there will be greater hazards. That means higher risk. More frequent, stronger storms and floods along urban coasts and tidal estuaries all the way up to us to Troy. There will be more days with more extreme precipitation events, more street and infrastructure flooding above and below the ground. There will be more extreme droughts. It will be in some places, it's not clear whether New York City or not, water shortages in some areas, and we have seen that in this couple of weeks ago in California, urban brush fire hazards. We have that in Long Island occasionally. There will be more hot days, there will be more peak energy demand, there will be occasionally heat fatalities. Europe lost 50,000 people in a couple of days two years ago. There will be air quality issues, ozone, asthma. There will be higher and more frequent climate change related losses. I said before the current losses can be estimated to be about 4.5 billion a year in the year 2000 on an annualized basis. Current estimates are quite uncertain for many reasons, but I'm going to, so my best estimate is somewhere between one and a half to five billion per year, and we will lose on average. <coughs> so we should use some of this money to do something and see how we can reduce those one to five billion per year. And some people say, oh, no problem. We just insure ourselves a bit of that. Well, you're a house owner. That's our county, Suffolk County, five boards of New York City, and in the Chester County. We cannot get any new hurricane wind insurance. We cannot get any Because the insurance industry has, has listened for a decade now to talks like that. Very careful. They there are people crunching their numbers. And they came to the conclusion that this is an uninsurable risk. So they walked away. It would be very interesting to see what the insurance commissioner up in Albany is doing. There are already cries for a public state insurance of last resort. I think that's banned policy. I think we should <coughs> be put ourselves into more risk instead of being of a fake insurance which is just saying the inland taxpayer should pay for it. That's what it means. So what does it mean? There will be limitations more coming down on also commercial wind insurance. That is still available. A residential wind insurance is not there will be more restrictive federal flood insurance. We have seen that already in 2000. Congress passed the law that goes under the name of mitigation, uh, disaster mitigation law. It said three times out. That means you are flooded three times. If you don't do anything, you're not part of the flood insurance anymore. They made offers to various communities. They moved several of them on the back 
banks of the Mississippi River for higher ground. Well, you can't move all of New York for higher ground, but there is higher ground in New York. So we have to move a little bit closer together in the future if you really want to have this increase by one million population in this town and have less real estate available to do it. Or we have to be extraordinary engineer or type architecturally inventive how to deal with it. So insurance will be more expensive and less available. It will be higher deductibles instead of the first thousand dollars you may have to pay on your home the first ten thousand or fifteen thousand dollars before you get the insurance pitching in. And there will be lower ceilings. If your house is lucky enough to be a million dollars worth, maybe you get only the two hundred thousand. And that's it. So you're jammed between a high deductible and a low ceiling. That's the insurable part. You really have to crawl in that space. There will be tighter <laughs> federal disaster relief aid to communities like New York City, smaller communities outside. We've seen that already. Because Congress is tired in coming out with extra tax money to give to FEMA. There's a question of efficiency, of course, how the money is spent. But they are tired of giving more and more money into the flood insurance program, the national flood insurance program, that's not based on an actuarial risk for younger people. <coughs> so what are our options in terms of adaptation? Well, one option is always to do early warning and evacuations. But that only saves lives, that doesn't save livelihoods. So we have to have a first in operational preparedness and a first case hurricane fleet. Uh, largest plan is in the order of about two to three million people left to be evacuated. Uh, yet we can, of course, and must assess in a more systematic way, as I have shown you only a little bit some get some pieces of risk assessment here. We must systematically assess what our risks are to the assets on the waterfront, but also internally for street flooding, subway flooding, from rain, from other events, not just from storms. We must be prudently working on restoring or at least preserving wetland areas as buffer zones and combine them with smart planting such that the debris that comes in from the flood waters has a buffer, buffer zone to lose its energy before it hits the buildings mm -hmm. that are on the front row. You may have seen some of those huge barges that are landed in Missouri somewhere in there. Well, we don't want to have tankers in our street. We can raise and harden some structures. I mean, I can possibly conceive how Columbia may perhaps deal with this issue. They have raised up to it. But there may be some engineering options that they can take to minimize the risk, not eliminate, but minimize the uh, one option would have been, of course, to make a levy up front and then the whole 125th Street inlet. That sort of radical engineering way, that's sort of the Moses way, uh, would have <coughs> been possible that was missed probably 10 years ago when they planned this park. But a levy could have been possibly incorporated into this park system. That's down the drain. Or if you do it, you have to start all over from scratch. So again, we missed sort of opportunities if you want to pay, go the Moses way. And we are here in the Chain Jacob, 
assuming maybe that's not the good way, as I showed you, because eventually those levees will get just too high in order to do their job as the centuries progress. <coughs> so what do we do? Well, we have to, for the time being, clearly increase the peak capacity of our road drainage system, the storm sewer system, the treatment plant, the barge and energy supply. Unless we really reduce energy that's another means. <coughs> and we have to really clearly think about flexible and adaptable growth design planning, which means we cannot do everything now what will be needed 500 years from now. But we can grow with the hazards and keep in mind what we may have to do it in 100, 200, 300 years ago when we make major projects in this city. So we don't have to redo it all in 100 years again and you know, hand this big bill to our country. There's an equity issue, a social equity, generational equity issue. And we are right now really living and planning on the expense of future generations. That's unfair. The simplest that it's a moral ethical issue. It's not an engineering issue. What can we do for individual buildings and projects? We can do all the steps. We can put green roofs on it so the heat island effect gets reduced. We can capture the rainstorm water that so it doesn't run into the street, it doesn't run into the sewer, it doesn't make an overflow, it doesn't go into Hudson and the East. So we can capture several of this so they stay with the building for a while until the worst is over and then we gradually release them. So we will build building buffer capacity, green roofs and related drainage systems can do part of this. We should have, for instance, um, Parking lots that are permanent instead of sending off this stuff right into the next sewer. So it can infiltrate into the ground. Then, of course, the MTA had to deal with that because if it infiltrates in the ground, they get it into the suburbs. But at least it's profit by a couple of days. It's not instant. So we have to do a lot of flood proofing of basements and put the infrastructure probably not below those blood zone levels. I indicated to you some We probably have to spend a you third know, fourth floor on the rooftop putting the infrastructure into we have it custom to put in the basement of structures. Um, we can put garages in it because you can pull the, the cars out before they get wet. But you can't pull your infrastructure out before they get wet. So there will be a lot of rethinking how we need to the, how we lift this power away. <coughs> uh, we may have to uh, put floodgates in bathtubs to not have to propagate the floods from one part of the basement to others, as I showed you. Uh, we will have hotter days, so we have to increase the insulation capacity of buildings. Uh, there will be more moisture in the air, not just mm -hmm. higher temperature. So all this, there will be new what's called climate normals that NOAA is developing that then engineers and architects will use for all the regions so they can deal that, or, with the fact that buildings have to cope with these new conditions. You are working very hard to develop these uh, climate norms. Uh, <coughs> you may want to think more about decreasing the air leakage to increase the AC efficiency, both with high peak temperatures and all that. On a larger scheme, the city urban land was land use planning, we really have to rethink a lot more than just on individual buildings. So yes, we can do a little bit on the heat island effects and trees and parks, but uh, 
we really have to think about in a systematic way from the DEP to DOT streets and roads and surfaces about this whole infiltration process so we don't send the storm waters where they really can pass down. We clearly have to do rezoning of our waterfront uh, to clear uh, to clear for storm surge buffer zones. And whatever buildings there are, they have to be sort of the first level of defense. These front buildings will have to act as defense buildings. They can be part, and I just there was told from an example of Ron Schiffman talking about when someone told me was wrong. In Hamburg, where they uh, have built uh, uh, a whole front of buildings, which is essentially the levee system. But that has to be architecturally designed for that purpose. That's not how we build it right now. So we have to adjust the FEMA firm. That's the firm stands for flood insurance rate, which have become the functional planning documents for the home rule, how planning boards go about doing their business. Well, out with them. He was way behind. There was a meeting uh, half a year ago in Washington, D.C., where I happened to be the chairman of a conference with 300 people, and I spotted the FEMA guy, and I said, I take the prerogative of the chairman to ask a question to the FEMA. I asked him, when are you recognizing sea level in your coastal flood zone? And he said, without blinking an eye, when Congress demands it. That's you, folks. Demand. I'm a little bit of an activist. So, FEMA maps, if they are being reworked, is fine. If not, the city better do its own stuff in the state. And some states have to take it go on. North Carolina, I think, it is. One of the two Colorado states. And the deal is the amount said, give us the money that you would spend to do it, we're doing it ourselves. You know what we want. We don't have to wait for you to come. I just talked to the, the climate change office of the governor a couple of days ago. Let's talk about that. Let's see what happens. Whether the state really gets it right to do we clearly have to improve our infrastructure. And I don't know yet how to do it, and I'm not sure if anybody does that. But for instance, for the subway system, what it means, the right now is an open drain system that essentially does the ventilation. <coughs> when you walk on the side road, you hear the subway rumbling on an easy road, you can see it sometimes in the box. We essentially have to <coughs> shut all this off, seal it off. I was just in Taipei, Taiwan, and you go into the modern subway system here, which, by the way, I mean, wonderful modern subway system. You don't go down into the subway system. You go up to the subway, and then you go. You go essentially over the levee system. Into the subway. Can you do that here? Climate change, we could get a free ride on. Boy, we will go to the UK. But the new is pretty soon. This is the <coughs> One option is to protect the entire car carbon estuary, but I think that's unsustainable. Because if we ask for it, and I'm not willing to pay ourselves for it, and then we still have inequity between those in and out, we can't ask the federal government to put up most of it. Because, as I said, Miami wants it, Sacramento wants it, everybody wants it. And I don't think the senators of the will vote for that. So, now, now it's scheduled. Yes, 
struggle with our own problems. So we have a real major problem globally, so we are not alone in the boat. But one thing is clear, both globally and locally, urban planning will clearly need to take on totally new meaning conditions. Whether we like it or not. And with that,